And this is the Law and Crime Network. Hello, everybody. Welcome back. I'm Michael Bryant. We are in two trials right now. If you've been following the Grand Amato case out of Florida, you can uh, continue to do that on lawandcrime.com. We're in Georgia for the Rosenbaum case, uh, and the defense is putting on their witnesses. Just leaving the stand was a uh, nurse practitioner who treated and advised an x-ray for Millie, the older little girl, Layla's daughter, uh, Layla, Layla's sister. And it sounds to me like they were using, the defense is using this witness to suggest that, hey, kids have normal injuries that happen when they're playing in the, uh, on the playground or, or they uh, you know, have bumps and bruises, innocent injuries. So they're trying to, I think, suggest to the jury, those things happen, they happen to Millie, they happen to Layla. While I've got the moment here, we've got a new witness coming on, I believe, but I want to bring uh, on the program here Matthew Maddox, who joins me, criminal defense attorney Matthew Maddox. How are you doing, sir? Doing well, Michael. Thank you. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you for joining me. This is a fascinating case. Give me your thoughts on it at this point before we go back in for that new witness. I think the, the defense is doing whatever they possibly can do and what they should do, as you've already intimated, putting on witnesses, mostly professionals, to counteract this this really cumulative effect of the prosecution's witnesses who build up and build up this case of abuse leading to murder. They're doing exactly what they have to do, Michael. Yeah, and is it uh, effective? Is it a big hill to climb? Um, you know, what do you think so far of the defense case? I think it's a tremendous hill to climb. I think it's more of a mountain than a hill, don't you? I think <laughs> that, uh, I, I think that uh, the, you know, week, days and weeks of testimony on the states, on the state side, Many professionals, many medical professionals, uh, that's, a, that's a great deal of evidence to overcome for these jurors. Well, the defense is at it again. Corrine Mull is uh, direct examining the latest witness in the defense case. Let's go back to court. On the stand now in this Rosenbaum case is Debbie Britt. She is sort of a, an acquaintance, a loose friend of uh, Jennifer Rosenbaum. And you're listening to testimony about how she sort of saw the kids, not sure which one, when, where, how, but the most important testimony, I think, Matthew Maddox, criminal defense attorney, is an attempt to kind of narrow this time frame to, to, to figure out when the injuries occurred prior to Layla's death. And I think now we've got it down to, if you believe this witness, somewhere around Halloween 2015, which would be about 17 days before Layla died. But does that really help if this woman, this witness, doesn't have the intimate knowledge of the people she's talking about? Yeah, I, that's, a, that's exactly what I'm concerned about with what they're doing with this witness. Um, you know, she seems nice enough, but uh, the, 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 I think the jury is going to ask, so what? what? What is what's so important about what she's going to offer here? I don't think she has a depth of knowledge or experience that the defense needs to counteract what's happening on the state side. Yeah, you're a defense attorney. You must be angsting for this, you know, Corrine Mole, who is no, uh, you know, shrinking violet. You know, she's she's doing the best she can with what she's got, but it just seems so weak. You, you're that's exactly right. I'm, I'm watching this, and she's, you know, she is doing yeoman-like work. She's doing exactly what she needs to do. But boy, I'm, <laughs> it's a lot of anxiety yeah. watching, trying to, trying to put this together. She's got a lot of work ahead of her. And that will continue. We're going to get back into the courtroom again in the Rosenbaum matter. This is the defense case in chief. We'll be back after this break. This is the Long Crime Network. So Debbie Britt was the latest defense witness there, hopefully helping the defense uh, explain away some of the injuries or maybe give us evidence there was fewer injuries than we thought. I don't know if it was helpful or not. Matthew Maddox, uh, criminal defense attorney, you know, we talked about it just a few minutes ago. These witnesses seem to have such superficial knowledge. This witness even correcting what was testified to on direct when she was uh, asked a question on redirect. So, I mean, you know, uh, is it more harm than good? You know, first of all, Michael, you got to be really, really careful when you call a lawyer to the stand, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the way she qualifies her answers and requalifies is uh, is a problem. But you know, every mo moment that she was on that stand, I was getting more and more tense. I, I I I hope for the defense and for that defense attorney that at best her impact is neutral. I'm afraid that it may be even a little bit negative. You know, I'm going to talk to you about an issue that is a huge issue in this case, and it has to do with the representation of both the defendants. I've talked to, to a lot of my guests about it. We've talked about it here at the network. Are you concerned? Are you surprised that the same attorney represents Jennifer and Joseph Rosenbaum in this case? That is just about stunning to me. Uh, I don't I don't care. I don't care what type of letters are produced and what type of sign offs you get from two co-defendants. 
Um, I don't, and e even in lesser cases, if you're going to trial and if there is any possibility whatsoever that one may develop uh, the opportunity for an antagonistic defense against the other, this creates a potential nightmare. And of course, all those appeals and habeas corpus petitions that can follow thereafter. Yeah, as I've mentioned before, and I, I, I'm trying to think how many times I've heard Joseph's name mentioned, and it's maybe a handful, but, you know, if you're representing Joseph, he's sitting there saying, you know, you know, she did it, and, and that's, that's his alibi. Do you see in this case, let's, let's uh, ignore the appellate issues for now, the jury wrestling with this. Um, I could clearly see a split verdict in this case where they nail her for everything and give him a pass. What do you think? I, 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 that can happen, Michael. My worry, if, if I were representing both of these people, um, and of course, if I were representing only Michael, and I think that's what he should have, his own representation, that defense that I had nothing to do with this becomes, a, a, you know, the, the, the mission of his singular, distinct defense attorney. Um, my worry is that this jury brushes them with the exact same brush and says, you know, if, if she knew what was going on and she did this, he was in, complicit and we're going to convict him as well. That's a big worry here. Yeah, and I know that the charges against him are those types of charges, and, and the evidence, as scant as it's been, is that he could have done more to prevent further injury, certainly could have done more to prevent Layla's death, but, this, but, but, but the overall evidence against him is just so weak. It's almost as if the prosecution is saying, hey, uh, you know, look at all these evil things she did. He didn't stop them. Let's blame him for a little bit uh, of that, too, and convict him on some lesser charges. I think that's a much easier task for an attorney assigned to him only. Uh, I, I, think I think you're right. I think they, they can deliver a split verdict. That just, it's, it's easier or it's a simpler matter for this jury, especially where the subject matter is so emotional, where the reaction to what's happened to this child can be so visceral. Um, I think it's much too tempting for a jury, again, to convict them both, maybe not convict him on all accounts, but convict him on lesser accounts simply for not intervening. You know, we, uh, the jury, by the way, is on a quick break there. They're on a 10-minute break in that courtroom. So, uh, Matthew, let's take this opportunity to listen to one of the, the chilling moments early on in this case, and that is, it's an always an important part of any case, the 911 call. This is Jennifer Rosenbaum, the defendant, on the 911 call to the cops. There's the 911 call. Uh, Matthew Maddox, let me ask you first your impressions of Jennifer Rosenbaum's demeanor and how she said what she said. I think she has the tone right. I think she has the content right. I think that um, that there's a set that an appropriate sense of alarm and even panic. Uh, it sounds like a sincere, a sincerely distressed foster parent, if not actual parent, in that call. Yeah, and that's something important to to remember. That uh, you know, I've suggested there might be a totally different affect or approach if you're the natural parent versus a foster parent who's been with this child for only four months. Uh, and I think you're right. I think there is the emotion there you might expect. Now as we're hearing more about the case and the prosecution's belief that this whole choking on chicken was kind of made up after the fact that maybe some severe injury, including the splitting of the pancreas, which was leading to this uh, young child bleeding out, that it was only when the child got so bad that they picked up the phone call 911 and then came up with this idea about the choking uh, on the uh, chicken chunk. What do you think about that whole defense theory and the prosecution's attack on it? Well, I think that panic can arise either because of, because there's a child who's been choking on chicken and they can't save this child with an amateur attempt at a Heimlich maneuver, and panic can arise um, after some type of uh, malicious act that has gone too far, as you've intimated, and then the panic sets in and you have the exact same tone in calling 911. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, I haven't seen all the days of testimony here, Michael, but is, is there going to be, you know, has there been, and, and who is the expert going to, going to look like, and how is he going to sound in uh, trying to counteract what has been a mountain of medical and scientific evidence on the prosecution side. Yeah, we have yet to see the defense list of witnesses that might include an expert on that level. It's been mostly these percipients, a sort of friend witnesses. So we will see as this defense case continues to unfold. Matthew Maddox, let me thank you for, for quickly stopping by. I know we had some technical issues. Hopefully we can get you back, spend a little more time with you next time. But thank you for your time today. I look forward to seeing you again.
Take care, man. Okay, so we're going to wrap things up for this afternoon and stand by for Linda Kenny Bodden. She is standing by. She's coming on here. Some people say we're the same person because we haven't been on in a while together. Uh, Michael Bryce saying, see you later. This is the Law and Crime Network.